Thank you. The split between Jews and Christians began about 2,000 years ago when most of the Jews at the time rejected Christ as the Messiah. The Jews that accepted him as the Son of God became known as Christians. That sounds very elementary, but perhaps it's necessary to point it out. Now, uh, my two guests, Miriam has moved to a spot in the audience, and we've been joined by someone else. You remember that uh, Tavia Zareski was here. He is a missionary for an organization called Jews for right. Jesus, an organization which tries to convince Jews that Jesus really is the Messiah. Our new guest could be called perhaps an anti-missionary. Julius Sis left his Jewish faith to become a Christian. For five years, he studied, he examined, he evaluated the life of Christ. But then he decided he'd made an enormous mistake. Jesus was not the Messiah. He returned to Judaism and now talks with other Jews about what happened to him. Please welcome him to Kelly and Kevin. And your teddy bear. I'm sorry? And your teddy bear. Thank Again, you. Let's Hello, have him with us too. What did you find out about Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, as he's known, that sent you back to your original faith? Well, Jesus perceived in many ways as a very nice fellow. But the issue of Jesus was, was he or was he not the Messiah of whom the prophets speak? And initially I was convinced based on my... Uh, indoctrination into Christianity that Jesus was the Messiah and as a result after having had just a, an opportunity to examine but uh, a few elements of the Bible uh, and having it having a sense of it being true I committed myself to Christian faith but then what followed was five years of practice and in that practice I studied the uh, Bible read every day attended Bible studies and while I began to get an appreciation for my uh, statement of faith, my commitment, I also started to see very quickly that there were some problems with the Jesus of the New Testament. He wasn't always the nice guy that he was cracked up to be. In many cases, he was very vicious. For instance, in the situation when he went into the temple and turned over the tables of the money changers, uh, an act of extreme viciousness, but, I mean, you can't hold it against the money changers. They were there to change money for Jews who came from distant, land, distant lands who wanted to buy uh, sacrifices, or for him to curse a tree because it didn't bear fruit in its season. Jesus walked up to a, a fig tree, and because it wasn't the season for bearing of fig trees, he cursed it and it died. I mean, elements of a character that would do this show me that he wasn't always the nice fellow, but that's not the issue. And I must say that as I'm speaking right now, I have to say with sincere apology to all the true uh, Christians that are in the audience and in the television audience, that as I'm speaking here today, I find that I feel apprehensive because I know that in no way do I want to say things that will interfere with the faith of a believing Christian and deter their commitment to God. But because I know that we have a Jew for Jesus missionary who is years of practice in converting Jews to, or trying to convert Jews to Christianity, I felt deeply in my conscience I couldn't allow this man to get on this stage alone without trying to defend the Jewish people in this issue. So you'll forgive me if some of the things I say go against the grain of your commitment to Christianity, but they must be said because there are Jewish positions on this argument. Let me ask you a question. During the, the five years that you were a practicing, studying Christian, did you convert other Jews to Christianity? I did have a helping hand in bringing several, uh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact number, because one does not know in which, in which way he influences. You did like, not go directly one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one with several individuals, and yes, they're Christians to this day. When you re-embraced Judaism, yes. did you return to those Christians and say, whoa, I was wrong, ergo, you are wrong, be a Jew again? Well, yes, I have made attempts at trying to um, reach, uh, particularly my Jewish friends who I converted to Christianity, to try to ask them to uh, reconsider their position. But the problem is, because I no longer believe in Christianity, the Christians that I was involved with paint me as the devil. They say I'm possessed by Satan. And as a result, they instruct these other Jewish believers who I had an influence in getting into their, br their brand of Hebrew Christianity not to have anything to do with me, because to talk with me is to deal with Satan. And they um, 
refuse to have anything to do with me. This man represents Satan, Tuggy? I'm trying to figure out how he converted somebody to Christianity. That's where I'm, I'm still back there. Uh, you what know, do you but, mean? You have to expand on that. Well, um, you can present uh, a message. You can present an issue and let people investigate it for themselves. They're going to, human beings can, uh, have a uh, God-given intelligence. They can come to their own conclusions. I agree with them 100%. So, you, it's not that he converted people. I he, didn't say I told converted. told him about I, the Jesus Christ. Right. That actually was my phrase. That's right. I'm sorry. That's right. I'm sorry. For expediency. I'm sorry. I think that's fair. To public to say, no, I don't. Nobody I, converts anybody. Is that what you're saying? That's right. That yeah. uh, you that's lead right. the way and the individual will convert themselves. To my a, life is a signpost pointing to the Messiah. Okay. okay. But okay. I've got it. It, I don't think anybody thinks that, that Mr. Sis is a, uh, a representative of Satan. I think the idea here is some of us who knew him uh, Moish Rosen, executive director of Jews for Jesus, said that he met him at uh, a conference in the mid-70s and said he, that, at that point he recognized that there was something that was spiritually defective about him. And I've got to ask a question. Did you at any point ever offer a prayer in the name of Jesus Christ and see that prayer answered? You know, it's interesting that he says there was something spiritually defective of me. I was teaching Sunday school for several years in the group I was with. I, I, I directed the choir of, of the congregation in Toronto. I spoke in churches, gave sermons, uh, I spoke on radio programs and TV programs in defense of my faith. For there, some, for there to be some spiritual impediment is a technique used by missionary organizations to try to uh, cause fear and trepidation into the uh, people that they're uh, dealing with. Right now, I'm just going to accept what you said, that Moise Rosen said, as just a tactic that you're using to try and make me feel a little bit... What about the question? Did you ever pray? Pardon? Did what? you ever pray to Christ and have it answered? Yes, I did. So why did you lead him? Yeah, but I also prayed to Christ many times and had it not answered. But does that mean... Maybe you know, he was like, saying no. I'm going to ask you something. <laughs> when you flip a coin, I'd like to say one thing. If you flip a coin and you pray to God in the name of Jesus Christ that it be heads and it's heads, was it Christ that answered it? And if it lends on tails, was it Christ that answered that? Or is there not a possibility in life that certain things will happen regardless of your prayers? The idea of prayers is to give a person faith in the God-given ability to make the right decisions. We do not hope that the right things will fall into place all the time. God gave us the freedom of choice, to choose between good and evil, and we must be able to make those choices. Granted, God wants us to pray. He wants us to seek His guidance in every way, both Jew and non-Jew, to seek Him, to love Him, and to put Him in our lives. But to think that certain prayers are answered and therefore Jesus is in your life, and then if certain prayers aren't answered, does that mean Jesus isn't your life, isn't the issue? Because life deals three blows. Yes, no, and maybe. And that doesn't necessarily mean always that Jesus answers your prayers. There's a fourth. Thou shalt make a station break. We'll be right back. I'd like to address... I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Julius. Um, you said that you felt that Jesus was a vicious person at, at times. Yep. You said... and. I can understand why you would feel that way, but on the other hand, Jesus was a man and had regular emotions of men. Um, but how do you view God when he destroyed the world with the flood, um, what he did to Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, and the list goes on and on? First of all, you have a misconception that God did not destroy the world. He removed most of it, but he preserved it through Noah and his sons because Noah and his sons proved to be the only people on earth that had any semblance of righteousness. He also saved every species, and he, his desire was to eradicate an immense amount of evil that was in the world and start it afresh. So he didn't destroy the world. That well, let's put it this way. The world was on, on, on the brink of destruction. Um, God, does not, God does not want to see evil in this world, and he makes it clear in the Bible that those people who conduct themselves in ways that are awful and mean and vicious and crude, some of them sometimes deserving of death as a punishment of their deeds. Now, we have to understand God, who gives us his law, must know ultimately, ultimately what is right and wrong. And I'm not going to question God's reasons for doing things. I'm just going to thank God that he's given us an ability to know who he is through his Bible. Yes, sir. Julian, it, it seems, though, that you're missing the point. What she's saying is that the same Jesus who we call the Messiah showed anger, just as God shows anger. So why turn away from a Jesus as the Messiah when he is just expressing characteristics that are inherent to God himself? Yeah. 
my premise for turning, uh, making these comments about Jesus is because uh, the moderator, uh, John, asked me what did I think of the character Jesus upon reading the New Testament. I just pointed out those examples to show that he is not always painted out in the positive in the New Testament. But the reason I don't accept him as my Messiah is because he absolutely did not fulfill a single criteria of what the Messiah was supposed to do according, according to the prophets of the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament. You have to understand, one thing that both Jew and Christian agree on is that the Old Testament, or the Tanakh in Hebrew, is the Word of God. And in that Word of God, there are certain criteria that are given to the Jewish people upon which they should know how to conduct themselves in life. And one of the things that is an emphasis in this area is the fact that God gave the Jewish people a Torah in which he was told, in which he told the Jewish people how to conduct their lives and that the Torah would be an, an eternal document, an eternal law abiding forever upon the Jewish people. He also gave the prophets. Nowhere in the Jewish Bible is there any mention of a Messiah who was to come, die, and come again because Not he true. failed in his Not first true. attempt. Oh my. Also... There is also in the... I told you he was, there was a spiritual defectiveness there someplace. <laughs> the Jewish Bible basically minute, states think... that there are four criteria that the Messiah must fulfill in order to be the Messiah. One, he must bring about absolute world peace. Two, he must bring about absolute world recognition of God. Three, he must redeem the Jewish people both spiritually and physically and return them to the nation of Israel. And four... And four, he must be able to uh, restore the temple system. But when Jesus came on earth, the Jewish people could not be restored to the nation of Israel because they were already there. Two, there has not been a world recognition of God since the time of Jesus. Otherwise, the missionaries would not be spending their efforts in trying to missionize the world. Three, there is not a world recognition of God. In fact, there's more diverse opinions on who God is in this world than ever before. And lastly, when Jesus came, the temple was in existence, so it was impossible for him to restore the temple system. Those four criteria, as I understand it, according were not fulfilled. According to the rabbis, according, not according to the according Bible. According to the Bible. I'm sorry I've got to interrupt this theological filibuster because we have to take another break. I'm going to ask you to shorten up when we get back. <laughs> Thank you. By the way, the two gentlemen, uh, there's a book, Jesus for Jews, available for a dollar from Tubby's organization, which is Jews for Jesus. And on the other hand, Julius Sis suggests two books, The Real Messiah and Jews and the Jewish Christianity. And there uh, is also an audio cassette called Voices. We'll tell you more about that on the Kelly and Company hotline. And we have a call waiting, as well as seven dozen people here who want to be heard. Go ahead, you're on the air. Yes, I just wanted to address the four criteria that the gentleman just mentioned. Julia says. And specifically, I think the New Testament writers understood what this gentleman is saying. And, and they wrote and said, particularly Matthew, wrote to prove that Jesus was the king of the kingdom. He was the promised king. And yet, Jews have always thought, uh, and this man evidently, that Jesus was going to be a nationalistic visitation for just Jews. The Gospel writers, Jews themselves, Paul, a Jew among Jews, come out and tell us the nature of the kingdom, that Jesus was coming to come into the hearts of men, to change men from the inside, all men, and not just a nationalistic yeah. visitation to the Jews, right. although they were the ones who gave us the Messiah. Right. Thank you, sir. Mary? I want to respond to a couple earlier questions. This young lady here in the front who asked, who made the statement herself, in fact, she made the case for us, Julius, is that you said Jesus was a man, and you are right. He was a man, nothing more, and nothing less. Plain, wow. pure, and simple. <laughs> and that is why. I guess, and Miriam, furthermore, I guess you have to and please don't interrupt. Church, Christianity does not allow you to be rude. Acknowledge so that Jesus Christ was not only God, but man. As a good Christian, you should not be rude. Um, furthermore, Let's look at historical fact, okay? Let's start there. We just advertised two books. I want to recommend a third, S sometimes called the Old Testament. It's also called the Tanakh in Hebrew. And if you read that book, do so in the original form that was written, which was Hebrew, because in any language... Oh, and Mary McKee, not well, every person in the... <laughs> can read 
Hebrew. I understand that, nor can I read Hebrew, but learn it with somebody who does understand Hebrew. Because when you do that, the translation is very, very different than what you're going to find in the standard, the standard used uh, King James, James Version. Furthermore, are you, are you assuming that people who read Hebrew couldn't come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? Because a lot have. Amen. That's right. A lot. Can I answer that? Quickly. <laughs> I want to point out that from all historical data, and I'm going to quote here, I wrote this down so I do not misinterpret. The New Testament is a testimony of believing people. What they are saying is not history, not history, I want to emphasize that, but expression of their belief in Jesus as Christ. That was written, people, by a modern-day Catholic theologian. Okay? That's his, that's an opinion. The, the New Testament says that it was to be a historic record of Jesus Christ's uh, advent. Yes, I, I happen to have converted to Judaism. Fortunately, in my case, I did not have traumatic experiences with my family. But I'd like to ask Mr. Sis. Um, it's my impression that organizations, Hebrew Christian organizations, such as Mr. Zaretsky's and those of other people here in the audience, use, uh, in many cases, misinterpretations and deceptive tactics to try to woo Jews to belief in, in Jesus and often misinterpret uh, proper Jewish practice. I'm, what I'm wondering is, is, was this the case with you? Did you find that they tried to basically steal your mind? Well, I wouldn't say they tried to steal my mind, but I would say that there is evidence amongst uh, a variety of different uh, Hebrew Christian groups to employ uh, tactics of deception. I will cite actually in one of the Jews for Jesus pamphlets, uh, which is called uh, Jewishness and the Trinity. Uh, there came, comes an argument in trying to defend the Christian position of the Trinity that uh, in the Shema, the Jewish benediction of the unity of God, God's name is mentioned three times. And they quote that the Zohar is the source for defending this position of the Trinity. Yet in the Zohar, no such reference exists. And they give the Jewish person reading this pamphlet the illusion that Judaism supports their beliefs when in fact there is no evidence in many cases. Then they've used many other deceptive tactics such as Using, using, changing their names from an English name to a Hebrew name to show how Jewish they are, wearing um, Jewish articles. Wait a minute, how do you know somebody's motivation? I don't. So you just uh, allege that somebody changed their, changed a, a name to show how Jewish they are. So maybe that, I'm that, wrong, but one of the things they do... <laughs> so, but, but, anyways, go ahead, I can see you're trying to interrupt. Just a break, we'll be right back and more from over here, right back. <laughs> Yes, sir. I have a question for Julius. My name is Rabbi Alan Meyerowitz of Congregation B'nai Moshe in Oak Park. Julius, I grew up in a very assimilated Jewish home with very few Jewish values and really not, not an intense Jewish ritual life. And uh, in, sometime in college, I rediscovered Judaism. And sometime in college, I found out what a beautiful, moving experience it was and how it really uplifted me and made me feel like a filled, fulfilled person and a person of who I wanted to be and very, very close to God. Don't you feel that the Jews who are searching outside of Judaism really should come back and look inside and, and find it within their own and rediscover Judaism. Don't you feel like they're looking outside because of ignorance or for, for a desire to assimilate instead of, instead, of, instead of finding out who they are and what their roots are? Jew, Judaism is for Jews and Christianity is for Christians. Wait a minute, you just said I just that, that exactly exactly what you do question. Ask Julie, I, but, I would like to say one assumption. thing that you have to understand in regards to that question, that 99.9999% of all Jews who get involved in any kind of cult have the background of ignorance. No Jew who gets involved in That's a religious the group I was talking about. who get involved in a religious group have the orthodox background that some of them claim to have. You'll find that in, in every case, if a Jew was uh, informed in regards to the traditions and the understanding of our Bible, they would not be converting to Judaism. To be a true convert to Christianity or any other religion, one must come from a background where they truly, fully understand the religion that they're coming from. Otherwise, to jump into a religion without a source from which they're coming. That isn't conversion. They may as well be picking Hare Krishna or Munis or whatever. It is just basically a statement of a decision to go along with a faith system that feels good. And most people that respond to this, be they Jew or Gentile, are often doing so because it is emotion response. But specifically, the Jew does it because they have no idea, no concept of what Judaism teaches us, what God has to teach us in regards to our spiritual and personal connect connection with him. Speaking of response, Tavia? Uh, very simply, it's an ignorant statement to, to, make, to say that because Thank there have you. been Jews who have over the years been, been very learned in, in uh, Judaism and have come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
plenty of them. I mean, how much Jewish education do you have to have before it's okay to believe in Jesus? Well, uh, you'd have to say that you'd have, have enough education to understand that the Jewish Bible, which was given to Jews by God at Mount Sinai to the entire Jewish nation and a revelation in which every Jew in the nation of Israel accepted and revealed and re the revealed There'd word of God of with at least that much the book had been preserved at the cost of many lives for thousands of years then it comes along a person who some claim to be the Messiah and introduce a document that totally contradicts uh, the word of God as Jews understand it, and we're supposed to give up everything that we know as certainty Julius. for the possibility that the New Testament and Jesus is the Messiah. This young man just celebrated a birthday standing up and waiting Happy for you to birthday. finish. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mr. Sis, uh, my name is Jim Crow. I'm proud to be a Christian. And I'm proud that you are too. Um, I think, in my eyes, you're saying Gorbachev might as well be the Messiah because he's promoting world peace. To tell you the truth, he would and make a better Messiah. I think you're wrong right there. You have, that's, that's rude, you had no right saying that. I feel you Jesus, said it. I feel Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. Uh, in the Old Testament book of Micah, it said, uh, But thou, O Bethlehem, though you be little among the nations, out of you shall come forth a king whose goings forth was from of old, from everlasting. Now, if that's not talking about Jesus Christ, who is it talking about? Sorry, but it is well, talking sure about King David and King away from their faith and why do you have to be a messianic Jew to be a completed Jew there's, where's there room for the Jews of the world there's the assumption that you're picking religion just like you're as though you're raising a flag in the community or you're opening the yellow pages looking for a church to go to I'm talking about a living relationship with the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and he wanted that through Jesus Christ that's the important the important element here it's not a, a an attachment to a religion or a people it's a relationship with a living god and that's available for jews and for gentiles i have a question uh, for julius do you think uh, according to the jewish bible the torah uh, what what kind of sin is it considered uh, for a jew to worship uh, a dead human being such as uh, jesus could you uh, he's not is, dead is he rose again from the grave major sin for, uh, he rose again from the grave a dead human being okay i, I don't know what I know that God commanded the Jewish people to worship him and only him. It's the first commandment, basically, that we should recognize God for who he is. There should be no other gods before him. And as a result, God, Judaism wants the Jewish, Jewish individual to worship God in his unity. And we do not believe that God uh, presents himself as Christianity should suggest it in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. I'm a Jew that came to believe uh, in Jesus 13 years ago. It was very hard uh, coming from my family uh, with friends, but I have continued to believe in Jesus and I have grown in my Jewishness. Jesus is not something foreign to Judaism. He is the, the heart and the spirit of true Judaism. And when a Jew believes in Jesus, he is doing the most Jewish thing that is possible to do. Young lady over here who's been anxiously waiting to be recognized. Yes, stand up, please. Okay, Julius, you said that um, there was Jesus was going to re not the never was going to restore the temple, and Jesus said he would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, and he did in his death and his rising again. Yeah. Well, why is it that the temple isn't there if he restored it? The Miriam just said, "Where'd you there, find so that?" He was he was speaking of his he was speaking of his resurrected body, which was a was. The Miriam just said, "Where did you find that? Where did you read that?" It's in the New Testament. New Testament, yeah. The temple in three days. He spoke of. He was said. He said Wasn't he was that figurative? speaking of his body. Yeah, he's figuratively speaking of his body. Figuratively speaking, but not actually speaking. There's a big difference. Well, when his body was resurrected, that was pretty. That was a pretty big deal. What'd you say? Separate fact from fiction. What's fiction? The fiction is what you just said. Anything You're that's figuratively it... spoken is not to be taken as actually happening. There is a difference between the figurative speech and reality. Are you saying that the New Testament, in your eyes, is fiction? <laughs> I'm saying in my eyes, as well as Christian theologians' eyes, it is fiction. And more that's, and more that's your required sacrifices for the Jewish people. But the Torah never required a sacrifice for a non-Jew. A non-Jew was always able to approach God directly without a mediator, just to express himself to God, and God promises that he will hear the prayers of the righteous. 
You do not need a sacrifice, and there is nowhere in the Torah where a non-Jew was ever instructed to have a sacrifice. An entire city of Gentiles in the book of Jonah repented for their sins, and not one offered a sacrifice, yet all were saved, both physically from destruction and spiritually. John, this question is directed to Julius. I think basically the bottom line is a lot of people are getting real upset and real offended and using personal beliefs and little um, snippets and tidbits. Well, how can you interpret this this way? How can you interpret this that way? Basically, the bottom line, I think what Julius is objecting to is not Christianity, and there's nothing wrong with people believing in Jesus. It's the aggressive missionizing efforts of the Jews for Jesus and the Hebrew Christians against the Jews. And I think what basically the bottom line is getting away from all the snippets and people's opinions and taking little quotes and everything is, if you read the Old Testament, no matter how accurate or inaccurate the translation is, the bottom line is a common theme comes through that this is an eternal covenant from which you shall neither add nor detract. Now anybody who looks at the Hebrew Christians and the Jews for Jesus, they don't wear yarmulkes, they're not Shomer Shabbos. Maybe some people do little bits and pieces, but they don't follow the Old Testament the way it was written. And it's very clear, like I said, no matter what the translation is, it says eternal covenant from which you shall neither add nor detract. So my question to you, Julius, is being that you were part of these people for so long, how can they get over that glaring problem, J come to Jesus, Jesus is for you, yet they totally add and detract and take and totally change what the Old Testament says, for a Jew as an eternal covenant. So the problem is that the, the uh, arguments in Christianity to present Jesus as the Messiah are very good in many cases. And to the person who is not trained in Judaism, they will find the arguments very convincing and therefore believe afterwards that the New Testament is the Word of God. When they believe that the New Testament is the Word of God, they use that also as a rule by which to govern their lives. In the New Testament, it says that we are no longer under the law and the Torah, which the Torah says will never be abolished. Well, there were learned Jews who, who came to faith in Jesus Christ, and I guess they knew enough about it to be able to, well, to put it together. They were spiritually deficient, quote, unquote. First, uh, first, I'd like to say that to Mr. Sist, I guess that is, that it'll be a shame to see that when Jesus comes back the second time, that you'll be looking for him to come the first time. But you know when because, the Wait, let me finish. You've talked, and I'm going to talk. Let me finish, okay? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, it's, it's just a shame that you don't believe in the literal content of the New Testament because it says, every knee shall bow Amen. and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But my question to you is that if Jesus was not the Messiah, if he was just, you know, what was he? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Yeah. What was he? Was okay. he a prophet? What do you consider him? Okay. A sorcerer? But with Even what? the Pharisees and Sadducees considered the man.